Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis Podcast. My name is Richard Acton. This episode, episode 32, we're covering part two, Phoenix of Adulthood Rights, the second book in the Xenogenesis trilogy, and we're looking at chapters three through five. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host. Michael Glinka. Hi, everyone. Hello, Michael. This time we have a uh, bit longer. We cover three uh, three chapters because they're relatively short. So yeah, I think especially the the second one we're looking at, or is it the first one? I the first one. The first one is very quite, very yeah, short. Yeah, yeah. Mm, it's only six hundred or so words. Yeah. Um. Mm. Just I don't know. I've edited the episode last time, and I don't remember if we actually if I give my predictions from the at the end of the last episode. Ah. Okay. Yes. So I just wanted to say that the I, I, my predictions for chapter three were the men realized that Akin is gone, so they tried to find him, but maybe some he somehow manages to escape him until someone else finds him, maybe mm-hmm. someone from Phoenix. Uh, that was my prediction, and I don't know if we said it in the last episode or not, but if we didn't, I apologize for that. I I, I don't remember if we mentioned it, but I think I think that uh, that general. Uh idea came up that we that we he might be found by someone else i remember that um i'd have to go back and check yeah <laughs> but anyway yes but that that didn't quite pan out right he was uh fairly immediately caught again yeah uh, unfortunately yeah. Mm. i mean you know what do you expect from a one-year-old child and like you know as much as intelligent he is his body is still mm-hmm. of a one-year-old child so he won't be able to move as much and as fast as possible you know as to, to be yeah, to be sufficient to escape from them, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I, it is interesting that uh, you know, having his mind in, in such a small body, right? It, it's a it's an unusual combination. Even in other fiction, where it's um, where, where we have like very smart kids, mm-hmm. things like Ender's Game, right? I think he's like six, something like that, at the beginning of that. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's it's still a little bit older than than uh, uh, than Akeen is here. I think it. In a way, it must be very frustrating for him, and I would imagine mm. be frustrating for him because, like, you lack the dexterity that you know, your body doesn't match your intelligence mm-hmm. in a way, right? Because you expect yeah. this level of intelligence of from a three, four year old, sort of, maybe five. I mean, but possibly even uh, more, right? Because his, uh, I mean, his level of articulation, I think, is probably um, that of a much older kid. Although, in mm. some ways, he's still. Um, yeah, it's an interesting combination, right? Because he's he's still kind of naive about a lot of stuff and and kind of new to things. But it's like it's almost like an adult mind that's still naive to a new situation. But like his level of sort of intelligence and analysis seems to be like much higher than you'd expect from from even yeah. a, an older kid. But uh, yeah, he still is quite ignorant of the world so yeah it's, it's a weird uh, i think it's combo. a perfect example of with the difference between intelligence and wisdom and uh, in his mm. case like he's highly intelligent but wisdom is ex- from experience and from you know things you've learned so and so uh, obviously this is high, like in dnd i would say it's a high intelligence low wisdom character <laughs> <laughs> okay yep good rpg analogies <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. Um, shall so we, should we uh, should we jump into the summary for chapter sure, three? Sure. Yeah. So chapter three um, starts with men the men um, realizing that Akin was gone. Uh, you know, after the whole situation of one of them try two of them trying to feed Akin with some poisonous beans, and then the whole situation, the chaos that then arose from that. And as hard as Akin tried to hide because of his age and small po- body, he just couldn't lose them. He could hear or occasionally see them, but no matter what, he couldn't get away fast enough. The advantage of his construct body was mm. that he could see their thermal print on their body heat and used to his advantage by hiding in the flora, but even that couldn't mm. fully hide him. Yeah, it doesn't quite manage to, to give him enough of an edge to, to escape them, which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. What we... We um, kind of talked about like the implications of having the ability to see an infrared uh, before in episodes uh, fourteen and twenty-two. Uh, I searched through the notes to, to figure out which ones those were. Nice, uh, good. But yeah, so uh, I don't know. if you want a more in-depth discussion of what it would be like to see an infrared, then uh, watch episode fourteen uh, and twenty-two. Twenty-two. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that. 
advantage didn't really help him because one of the men noticed him and then shouted to notify the rest. And mm. as he did, one another one just appeared, but this guy just oh okay, I will just follow the voice and then he tripped over um where Akin was hiding near a large tree and then as he was falling, you know, he re in a reflex he caught Akin. Um so the man called out to the other man saying that he got him. Um but the boy was wet and cold. But interestingly interestingly, Akin's body temperature was lower than the human, so his skin would always feel cold to humans. Hmm. Yeah, this is a kind of interesting characteristic of the the Owen Carly, right? I think we mm -hmm. we hadn't encountered that before, but uh, no. I mean, there, there is quite a lot of variance in in the average body temperature of um, animals that do you know, the the um, like endothermic um, thermoregulation, you know, that control their mm -hmm. their their internal body temperatures. Um, like so, for example, elephants are uh, about thirty six and a half degrees. Humans, of course, at about thirty seven. But um, so rabbits are thirty nine, and goats are like thirty nine point seven, almost forty. So there's a whole uh, whole range of different sort of uh, average temperatures. Although they all seem to be in a, a kind of broadly similar space, right between sort of the the high thirties to, mm -hmm. to like low forties seems to be like the the range that they're in 39 which, uh, degrees for rabbits and goats but based on biology wouldn't that denature the proteins in their bodies well presumably they're i mean it, it, like um the the hy hypothermal um hydrothermal vents for something yeah it's the hydrothermal vent uh, bacteria mm -hmm. um that are adapted to handling super high temperatures they're like almost boiling uh, presumably the um enzymes are adapted for a slightly different temperature range in these uh, other organisms which is an interesting interesting thing to think about oh interesting and have a look at the yeah. um, the st structural differences between the pr um, proteins between for example humans and rabbits or goats because it's 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 interesting because mm. you know on like everybody's thought that like no if your te body temperature is higher than 37 degrees you should be trying to you know lower it down because it can cause to serious you know problems especially if your body human body temperature reaches 40 degrees that's you no know, a danger in their uh, um, life because of the yeah. denaturing of the proteins in in our body so and then you have animals that i wasn't aware that have a much higher well much higher but two degrees uh a temperature a body temperature that's equivalent to a life-threatening situation in humans so mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And actually, I think like the, the first time I kind of like was I, I, uh, accounted that acutely was some, when like a vet read the temperature of one of our pet rabbits. I was like, oh, is that that's high? And they're like, no, no, that's actually normal for rabbits. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. I, I hadn't really given serious thought to that degree mm -hmm. of uh, like thermal variance within like uh, mammals. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, apparently that's the thing. Um, when um, it, it, mm -hmm. No, it's just about rabbits, because when I had the animal handling course done for my PhD, um, mm. they were showing, there was a picture of like four or five different samples of ra uh, rabbit urine on it. Mm. And the guy was like, so which ones are like, is it, no, is bad, right? Because one of them was like green, the other one was like purplish, the other one was brown, the other one was yellow. Like, mm. it's just everybody was like guessing. It's like, no, they're all fine. Yeah, rabbits are just weird. You can't really test. You, know, you can't really tell if the rabbit's healthy or not by looking at the urine. It's just they are like that. I was like, wow, well, okay. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a lot of variability in the color. Uh, I mean, I think you'd still get. Mm, I, I, I think a brown color might still be a, a little bit concerning because it might be indicative of some some bleeding. But other than that, yeah, pretty much. So yeah, <laughs> if you're planning to have a rabbit, yeah. expect expect you know multi a rainbow. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I don't know if it says anything interesting about the the Owen Carly that they have a slightly lower temperature. Um, I suppose it might mean that they have um, very slightly more uh, efficient enzymes in the sense that they can handle all the metabolic processes that they need in lower uh, body temperature at, at a slightly lower temperature. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Uh, hmm. I wonder because all, the only says that you know it always feel cool. So I guess maybe we're talking about. 35 degrees 34 something along the lines um i mean it, it, i think it could be it could be higher because even a, a small difference in 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 relative temperature is is, is quite perceptible um mm. by by touch right we're, we're surprisingly uh surprisingly sensitive to being able to detect that yeah 
So I, yeah, it might it might just be a small difference. But yeah, I mean another pattern that I heard someone note was that placental mammals are hotter than marsupials, which are hotter than monotremes. Which are the sort of three big families of, of mammals, um, or, or three like um, not big necessarily in terms of membership size, because there are only three monotreme species, but like deepest rooted differences in the mm-hmm. uh, the mammalian family. So that would, uh, and the monotremes are the oldest. The marsupials are kind of the uh, slightly more recent, and the placentals are, are, are the most recent. So there's a bit of a pattern there, but I'm not sure what that means. Potentially, no. and no. chickens also run very hot. So. I can I can I can tell that especially with the chickens being boiled in my frying pan. <laughs> That's a bad joke. Excuse me. Um, anyway, but yeah, we're, get, we're getting a little uh, sidetracked as usual. Yes. <laughs> um, so Akin was wet and cold, obviously, but as mentioned, mm. his body temperature was lower. So for humans, his skin would feel always cool. And so far, so far, the man didn't do anything. You know, held the boy and tried. He held the boy and tried to warm him up by rubbing his hand, much to Akin's displeasure on the boy's back. Poor kid, shaking like hell. I hope those fools haven't made you sick. What do we know about taking care of a sick kid, or for that matter, a well one? Um, mm. You know, the fact that the man didn't lift Akin by his leg was a pleasant change. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. <laughs> These guys really don't know what they're doing, do they? Yeah, uh. but it, this is interesting. The stroking, though, felt like being rubbed across eyes, but he understood the man was trying to be kind. So the mm. man, you know, rubbing his hand on Akin's back to warm him up basically felt like as if somebody was rubbing your finger against your eye. Mm. Ugh, God, yeah. that's so Ugh. pleasant. That's uh, not nice. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. But that's the uh, the downside of having like uh, a bunch of super sensitive sensors, right? Yeah, <laughs> you can uh, readily get overwhelmed by some uh, unpleasant inputs. I mean, you know, mm. it makes sense that like it it feels unpleasant because if you push your uh, finger against your eye too strongly, you feel one pain, and secondly, you start to see light, right? So it it like because of the overstimulation yeah. of uh, mechanical stimulation of your retina. So mm. it makes sense that. Uh, he will feel uncomfortable when you have overstimulation in the many different aspects. Mm-hmm. But, ugh, uncomfortable. But anyway, the chapter ends with the, uh, my, the description of the man. To be honest, only his um, head being ginger and mm. the the fact that he was the only one not involved in most of the events, keeping it to himself. You know, he was he was sta- just standing there when Tino was uh, killed, and mm. he was just staying quiet and just rowing in the canoe and stuff like that. so. Yeah, Akin, so we have uh, yeah him. We give him some distinguishing characteristics and have him as the kind of uh, the one who's just sort of tagging along. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So Akin just hoped that maybe by staying close to this man, he would survive long enough to be sold, and that's where the chapter mm-hmm. ends. Mm-hmm. Yep. So uh, things still looking pretty, uh, uh, pretty difficult for for Akin, right? He's uh, still not in a great place. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> Although I suppose he, he has the one guy who's at least not like actively trying to kill him. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that, that there's at least one person who is not incompetent, uh-huh. that incompetent as they were, but still. You know, mm. things can well, change I mean, very quickly. Potentially still incompetent, but at least aware of the fact that he's incompetent, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, baby steps. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe my chapter four prediction. For yeah. This chapter. yeah. So the journey continues, but this time under supervision of the gingerman, whom so far seemed to take care of Akin. That was my prediction. I, I didn't really could think of like what could happen next, right? But I was just hoping that mm. maybe that man would protect Akin enough uh, against the other men that were in the group. Mm. But yeah, okay. It's it's a very vague uh, <laughs> prediction because I really couldn't. I couldn't predict what would happen next chapter. It's just like, oh yeah, the journey is happening, continuing, but maybe no. Hmm. I don't, I mean, they still seem to be kind of leaving him to his own devices to a significant degree. But I mean, he is—he does have some more interactions with the with this uh, ginger man later on in, mm-hmm. the, in the chapter, right? Let's start with the chapter four, I guess. Summary: um, mm-hmm. The chapter starts with Vakin trying to stay close to the ginger man. Provide ginger man. I, 
<laughs> yeah, it's all we have to identify. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the moment I said it, I just imagined a ginger biscuit, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, the I really need man. to change yeah. the name for him. But anyway, that's the only information <laughs> we have so far. Uh, so it's canon, he's the Shrek character now. <laughs> <That's> the- <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 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 Okay, all right. Staying close to the ginger man to provide some protection from the others. Unfortunately, or fortunately for Akin, the next morning, Akin's original captor started vomiting blood until he collapsed. Hmm. Akin was terrified. You know, the man was in pain, bleeding, and all his friend could do was to turn his head on one side so he doesn't reswell the you know vomit the blood he vomited Mm -hmm. out. And you know, in Akin's mind, he could not comprehend why they didn't try to find an Uloi. Why were they allowing their friend bleed to death? Um, he knew that, you know, Akin knew that humans could not stop themselves from hemorrhaging without help. Uh, you know, Akin could do it on his own body, but wasn't able to teach a human only an Oloi could do that. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting how he thinks about that, actually, just the uh, sort of teaching the ability to, to like control whether or not you're, you're bleeding. It's an interesting uh, concept. I mean, as you but, pointed out in the notes, you know, we like, mm-hmm. we do have a blood clotting mechanism that would prevent you know stop certain level of bleeding mm-hmm. right in our bodies but there is a limit to that right mm. yeah i mean it, it's it's very effective at, at stopping bleeding when you know you haven't sort of nicked a major, major blood vessel but uh, uh, and you know it's a very sophisticated mechanism with you know all the platelets and clotting cascades and you know there's a, a whole set of complexity associated with it it's very effective at, at uh handling when there's a kind of a small leak as it were but uh yeah not not so much for a, for a more major bleed especially when you're but vomiting it, it, blood so who knows what the yeah. damage was in there mm-hmm. i mean uh, we, i think um i think later on actually in the chapter we get the the information that he does have an ulcer of some kind yes, that the yes. Elankali healed at some point yes um so i mean that, that could be caused by something uh, else like a, some kind of a, a gastric cancer but uh, in 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 the world these days, uh, stomach ulcers are caused by, um, I think, about three quarters of the time by um, Helicobacter infections, mm-hmm. uh, which was a, a point of contention for a long while. Um, and there was an, an interesting story, a, a sort of a science history story that came out of that whole uh, situation. With yeah, this uh, yeah. Australian scientist, Neil Noakes, uh, who was kind of, you know, convinced of this fact that you know it was the bacteria that were causing the stomach ulcers and and was struggling to get anyone else to to pay attention to this this uh, pretty you know uh, reasonable hypothesis that he had um and eventually ended up doing some self experimentation so he he like ate a culture of h pylori this this bacteria that causes stomach ulcers and gave himself a stomach ulcer and you know did got diagnosed with a stomach ulcer and you know had the the um uh, uh gastroscope looking at the ulcer and everything uh and then uh took an antibiotics course to treat it and it went away uh and uh i think this this was in 1984 uh and then uh, like about 20 years later i think he eventually got a nobel prize for for this work but yeah before that everyone was treating ulcers with um uh antacid type treatments um proton pump inhibitors that kind of thing Mm -hmm. Uh, which was not particularly effective. In fact, some it may have even aggravated it to some degree. I mean, but, uh, his story, um, I've heard his story, and this is really famous story of like a scientist, mm. uh, you know, in the scientific community being shunned because his ideas was like, oh, no, it's not, not true. And then, you know, he does something crazy and then gets a Nobel Prize for it. And it, this is one of those examples mm. when, when you do an experiment, right, and you're sure of it, but like, and... Yet people are like against what you're saying, right? And and to be mm. honest, this is this is the biggest I think problem with um like scientific community in a way that there are some projects that you can do or ideas that can investigate it, but when you do the investigation, you realize like this is not going to work. And there's some people who mm. can do this project and be like they believe in them and they work on them. And like the question is then, are you gonna spend your whole life on a project that's absolutely useless to do, or will you end up like Neil Noakes and get a Nobel Prize because you've decided to persist on this? Mm. 
I mean, it's one of those things where um, the funding model becomes a bit of an issue, right? Because mm-hmm. it's uh, you can get funded to look at the questions where there's there's um, a sort of a, a convenient commercial route to um, to like drug treatments and so on. But if you're not if you're working on something that people don't think is in some sense fashionable, it can be a lot harder to to get funding. Yeah, and I think part of the part of the the situation with um, the whole Neil Nix history was that the, the proton pump inhibitor drugs were you know new. Um, still under patent you know in, in label drugs that you could uh the, the pharmaceutical companies could could make some profit on mm-hmm. and you, you, you seem to get this quite a lot when it comes to the uh the development of drugs where it's like we well, maybe we could treat this with a cheap generic that already exists like mm, nobody gets any money to to look into the fact that we might be able to treat this with a cheap generic that already exists because uh uh, you know, not so much profit in, in those. Um, but the fact is that in a lot of cases, yeah. like you, you most in a lot of cases, you don't have to have some really sophisticated answers because you know the simpler approach you usually you would take usually actually is good enough, right? But I mean, it's it's oh my god, this is such a generalization. I'm st- I shouldn't have said that, but thinking about it, direct <laughs> perspective. But yeah. I mean, yeah, sometimes it depends. Yes. Right? Let's just say this was overgeneralization that I'm aware that is absolutely fucking wrong, but um, it's true within some aspects. And let's leave it at that. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. Yeah. But um, anyway, returning a little bit to the whole uh, clotting thing. Mm -hmm. um, So I think it's it's quite fascinating that the Uloi have this, uh, and perhaps the other Owen Carly have this degree of control, like in the. If they were, it's, it sounds to uh, like uh, you know, Akin is, is saying that like if if he you know someone like slashed an artery or something, they could uh, handle that. Uh, you know, they could like consciously constrict the blood vessel or something. I which, feel which like doesn't... so you know like when uh, in the previous book Joseph was cut by Kurt hmm. and he started visibly healing on their in their eyes, right? I think this mm-hmm. is what. That's when we discuss it. I think that um, the cells in their bodies probably are capable of um, much faster response to damage than, for example, in humans, right? Because mm-hmm. in the humans, when the normal process healing, let's say skin, right? We cut your skin. And then, the, first of all, this, like the detection of the um, at the area of the wound comes with the lymphocyte, macrophages, all the immune c- uh, cells that, you know... Um, mm-hmm destroy any bacteria or viruses that could potentially get in and then you know then and gobble up the whatever debris that um mm. collect and then you have you know platelets appearing and you know um to, to block the damage and then after that the epi- um, uh, epithelial cells in the skin the actually the leading epithelial mm-hmm. cells they call they start like crawling uh towards each other um you know other sides of the wound to just to start closing in right so that's that's the basically very quick let's say um description of the um healing process so i think that might be the case that basically this this whole process is much more um localized and much faster to localize uh in the case of onkali and the constructs um Mm -hmm. you know the the fact that no joseph was healing in literally in front of the eyes of every all human out there means that the process must be like boosted like really super boosted and mm-hmm. okay yeah so kind of a lot faster on the healing process yeah so uh, yeah, it might be yeah. the case that well i think i would imagine though that um so for example if you had a, an injury to a a reasonably major blood vessel right, you'd have to stop that hemorrhaging before you could really get into the, yes. the beginning of the wound healing process yes. right you need a you know a, a clot to form and the kind of scab uh scabbing i think that it contributes to the wound healing process to some degree right because around the fringes of that is where you start getting the the cells migrating if i'm remembering correctly yes yes that's correct you need like yeah. the fibrin hmm. fibrin yeah because it's uh, yeah yeah fibrin fibrin yeah, yeah. uh yeah, you I need fibrin in all this like to, to to catch the um platelets and all that and of course then you need fibroblasts to lay down the matrix for the cells to order so yes this it's more of that hmm. like probably i think i was going to say that i agree with you that probably um the construct and the uh, oncology probably can constrict their blood vessels to a certain degree so that it sort of stops the bleeding in a way Hmm. Which there will be a really interesting kind of level of like biofeedback control to have, right? To just be able to be like, you know, consciously decide to just like, you know, I don't want to pump blood to this finger anymore, just for like 
because I've nicked it. Yeah, that would be super useful. I, I mean, you know, like it's it's interesting because <laughs> we it's I'm surprised. I guess this is the energy um, aspect uh, of it, an energy cost in terms of evolutionary um, uh, mm. um, development. But like when you think about it, in our brain there is this artery that is basically I don't remember the name for forgive me for that, but like it's basically a circle. Right, it's it's a continuous circle mm-hmm. in the in our brains, and then so that when the major blood vessels go to it, the blood goes through that sort of circular vessel, and then from out that it branches the blood vessels go to all around the brain, so that it provides oxygen, glucose, and stuff like that. Right, but mm-hmm. that system has evolved so that in case you get a blood clot, the system is not completely closed. Right, you, you don't get full color. Uh-huh. If it happened, if a blood clot happened, that then you're pretty much okay because um the blood will still travel to where it's supposed to travel right to the rest of the brain Mm. so the reason why i'm saying is that is i'm surprised that our bodies haven't evolved in a way that in case anything happens for example you cut yourself and you still and you don't want to lose you know lose the um possibility for the blood to still reach the some region let's say you cut your arm or something and you still want the blood to reach your fingers and hands so you don't lose that hand um hmm. you would think that there would be some like let's say a uh blood vessels on the outside and the inside of the arm or something that would both travel maybe they are maybe they are, uh, my anatomy knowledge is just complete garbage and i don't know but you hmm. know what i mean is that there should be sort of like a backup system you know uh just in case yeah, yeah i suppose it's one of those like um uh energy cost of having redundant systems plus the you know whether or not there's a a, a smooth evolutionary trajectory that you can take yeah. you from from uh, from you know to a, a to b without having to have a you know a foresighted mechanism because i mean when you <laughs> think about uh, it there's only yeah. there's two main vessels going to the that connect um uh, vena cava i think that's the name of the vessel that goes to the heart is that correct to the heart yeah yeah i, I think yeah vena cava and the, the aorta right yeah so you have mm-hmm. those two main uh ve- a vessel in the artery right and then the carotid artery is the main artery that goes to your brain right that's only single one so if you would cut that like if you don't stop the bleeding you, you're gone right that's that's a, that's it um it's Hmm. usually because of blood loss but also because the brain isn't getting enough oxygen and stuff like that but you would think that you there would be some backup in a way for that just to make sure that it doesn't happen but hey Hmm. Um, although i suppose um like humans are uh, a unique system in the the sort of um like the degree of um like a self-awareness and and the detail of the self-model so I, i think for the most part you wouldn't want like for most animals, you wouldn't necessarily want them to have conscious control over things like you know blood flow, right? For the most part, you can handle that unconsciously well with kind of some some good heuristics, right? But uh, for us, it would be super useful to be able to have access to those kind of things and be like, ah, okay, yeah. Um, wh- while this finger is bleeding, I'm just going to like temporarily significantly reduce the blood flow to this finger so I can you know patch it up, yeah. and then we'll go back to having good blood flow. But like the uh, that re- re- requires a degree of like uh, judgment about whether or not a-, a particular limb should be getting blood or not, right? And that- that's a level of access to well, like the internals of how the system works. You and- say that, and then my the- first thought was like, <laughs> God, if we had this control, there'd be another level of sex fetishes. Like just, just you know, auto asphyxiation would be another. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, auto erotic yeah. asphyxiation, <laughs> as they call it. Oh my God. Okay. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but the yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about, right? No, because absolutely. The, the Yomagali seem to have this degree of like introspective access to the way that their own systems work, um, and we we don't yet. Um, but uh, yeah, it would be uh, super interesting to to be able to do that. But yeah, it's almost like we like, the one Carly have um, in computer analogy. They have like root access to their their biological operating Basically, system. Basically, right? yes, they can go yes. in and change stuff. Yeah. But but we're we're like unprivileged users of our biology. So yes. <laughs> you know, we get the uh, you don't have admin privileges to to stop the blood from flowing in a particular place. Oh, damn it! <laughs> Biohacking time. I mean, I just can't imagine somebody doing a pseudo RM or if it's just uh, their own system. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the, that's the problem, right? <laughs> if we had root access, we'd seriously fuck it up. Yeah, it's very quickly. It's like, oh, just I can imagine it's stuck overflow. Man. Hi, I accidentally cut this blood supply to this major vessel, and I don't know how to go. It like, but the system is not responding. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh dear. Actually, yeah. Now I think about it, yeah, doctors would probably not want you to do beyond. No, they they would be like, oh, what no. did you do this time? Sorry, I was playing with my fingers, and I, I think I completely cut out all the blood supply to my you know, hand. Yeah. So the level of stupid shenanigans they're dealing with with people showing up in um in the emergency room anyway. It's just like imagine if we had <laughs> that level of control over a biology. I know. It would be yeah. Uh, uh, maybe it's some in some cases it's better that we don't like. Hmm. Maybe. But anyway, I think. Anyway. Of the tangent, let's go back. Mm-hmm. So we're in the situation where the man is bleeding, and one of the men decide to go get some water, while the others were trying to take care of the said bleeding man. Um, the ginger yeah. man, you know, realizing the boy was you know sh- like shaking, was like decided to just take him away. Uh, to then to the same place where the first man went to get water, and as the man, you know, as they reached that area, the man was ex- as the man was exercising his frustration on the nearby tree trunk. Akin wanted to speak to him, but couldn't force himself to speak out. Uh, eventually, he took uh, Akin to his hands, hands and looked warningly and asked, "You're not getting sick, too, are you?" He asked, "Please, God, no." No, Akin whispered, and the man looked at Akin sharply and realized that one of the men, Tilden, said he thought Akin knew few words, but it seems that he knows more than few. Uh, Akin made a mistake. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if he hadn't made a mistake with with no, he definitely made a mistake when he answered the the kind of uh, the next question with yes. Yeah. Like, oh, mm-hmm. So yeah. this is like Akin did not realize until later that the man was not expecting the answer. And this is what the book says, and I think it's pretty much quite humanity pretty well. Human beings mm-hmm. talk to trees and rivers and boats and insects in the way they talk to babies. They talk to be talking, um, but they believe they were talking to an uncompre- uncomprehending things. It upset and frightened them when something that should have been mute answered intelligently. I mean, I would be also freaked out if a boat mm-hmm. responded to me. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, yeah. As someone who talks to themselves quite a lot, I would be a little disconcerted if, like, yeah. the inanimate objects in my apartment started talking back to me. <laughs> the, immediately, hello, doctor. Yes, I think I have a schizophrenia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the wall is responding to my questions. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I would I would say that you know it it hits pretty well. Everybody, you know, everybody. I'm sure, like, I mean, nowadays people even name their toasters and talk to them. Like, I mean, it makes sense that you know, like, if things responded to them, mm. that would be a big sign to go and see a doctor. Yep. Although, uh, like, increasingly now with like uh, smart home utility devices, like, if you took someone from like I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, oh my god, and put them in <laughs> put them in a house with like an Echo or an Alexa or something, and you know, they're talking to their freaking smart fridge. And it starts asking, <laughs> answering the questions. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> It'd be a pretty weird experience. Yeah, I, I imagine like somebody from eighteenth, nineteenth century, early like Victorian times, like when the fridges started mm-hmm. becoming the first, you know, first thing, and then you bring them here, and they're like, go, they go to, oh, this is a fridge, and the girls like they start talking, and they just, like, I can imagine the freaking how horrified they would mm-hmm. be. Mm-hmm. And even just like. Um, uh, headsets right mm. nowadays it's perfectly normal to see people walking down the, the street appearing to be just talking to themselves yes but like before the advent of, of wireless headsets that would have been like a pretty weird red flag right someone's just wandering down the road like talking to themselves no absolutely mm-hmm. i think What's going on here? there was a great um interview with a prisoner who was um in america who went to prison for i think murder in like early uh, just mm. after uh, I don't know, like 50s, 60s, I think. And then mm-hmm. the the person mm-hmm. came out from the prison and finished their um, the term. The term yes, that's the yeah. word I was looking at. The term, mm-hmm. like after, I don't know, 40, 50 years or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. And, um, and um, the first thing they said was like, I was, it was like difference in, you know, like the first time I saw cars, there was like, you no, know, like there was really cool retro cars as we called them. And now it's just like everybody's having mm. a car. Plus everybody I thought when they saw they were like FBI agents because they had like earphones in their like ears. Like that's the only yeah. situation is when you had like, you know, federal agents walking around. That's the only time he saw <laughs> something like this. Yeah. Uh, the old uh, two way radio things with the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. And up times change. Yeah, honestly, it's it's pretty crazy. So, uh, yeah, we were talking to ourselves, and we were disconcerted by the fact that the things were answering. And yes, 
Uh, the same thing happened to this guy who was talking to Akin. So Akin was just so terrified and worried about the man uh, that he forgot he shouldn't have spoken. Uh, Akin continued saying that the man will die if an Ulo is not called for help. But the man, losing the kindness and the, or friendliness in his voice, only said, What the hell are you? Akin fought further, asking why should his friend die? But the man said that he was 65 years, awake for 65 years, uh, and that he had an ulcer. Mm. The worms, as they called the Onkali, fixed it before, but uh, he would rather cut his own throat than having them touch him again. Akin looked at the man, Mm. tried to understand his new expression of revulsion and hatred. Did he feel these things towards Akin as well as towards the Onkali? He was looking at Akin. The conversation continued on Onkin's origins, eventually leading to a question about Boy's mother, to which Akin replied that he was born of a human woman. The man seemed curious, but not in the way that Tino was, but in the way some humans turn over rotting logs so that they can enjoy being disgusted by what lived there. The man asked then if Tino was Akin's father, and that caused the boy to start crying. He thought about Tino many times and still couldn't comprehend why would they hate him so much. The man answer is said that he was a traitor, but Akin said he never hurt other humans. He wasn't even trying to hurt anyone when they killed him. He was just afraid for the boy. Hmm. Yeah, that's a because um, uh, it, it's interesting because Akin kind of jumps straight to a saying something that is a, a very adult kind of concept, right? He's like, "This person is going to die if you don't get help." Yes, and his immediate place to go for help is the Uloi. So I can certainly see why, from the perspective of someone who has this like resistor attitude mm-hmm. that this is going to be really uh like disturbing to him because you know firstly he's got a baby that has this kind of adult understanding of of like the the seriousness of the situation yes. that his friend's in and he's saying you know you should call a new loy the the very thing that they're most like a- averse to so uh, absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. definitely a, a dangerous thing to be saying yes ex- yeah so it's mm. boy is intelligent but lacks the wisdom to Keep his mouth shut in exactly. that situation. And this is an excerpt from a book. The man looked at him with a deep disgust. You may not be valuable. Akin wiped his face and stared his own dislike back at this man who defended the killing of Tino who had never harmed him. I will be valuable to you, he said. All I have to do is be quiet. Then you can be rid of me and, I'm, and I can be rid of you. Um, the man just walked away, mm. but Akin knew they would not leave him. Akin was angry. Lilith once told him that human beings fear difference while the Onkali crave it. Humans persecute their different ones, yet they need them to give themselves definition and status, whereas the Onkali seek that difference and collect it. The Onkali needed to prevent stagnation and over-specialization. Lilith told him that once he grows up and starts to feel both of those feelings, he should embrace the Onkali way. Akin understood that he would Mm. never embrace the human nature after the humans not only rejected him, but also made him wish that he was strong enough to hurt them. And I think this is a beautiful paragraph that describes exactly what humans are. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it, uh, hits the, it hits the nail so well. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, the, the um, point about the, the difference is very interesting there. Cause, and the, the having the Owen Carly crave it. I think there's an interesting kind of a little story about when Octavia was, was writing uh-huh. this. Um, she, she was looking up um, words in the dictionary. And she had this sort of old edition. I, I think it might have been an Oxford English dictionary. And, and um, she was trying to find uh, xenophile. Um, or xenophilia, mm-hmm. um, and I think she couldn't find it in this this dictionary edition. Um, and there was uh, one uh, dictionary that had xenogenesis in there with the meaning, um, you know, having a, a, a the origin of something uh, very different from um, from the parents mm-hmm. of that thing. Um, and that that sent the, then in, in later editions, the xenogenesis went away. Uh, xenophobe was always there, and xenophile eventually came in. But it's kind of this this interesting uh, like change over time in, in what was uh, in the dictionary mm-hmm. uh, with these different words. But yeah, the the absence of, of xenophile whilst xenophobe was there, I think, is a, a kind of a, a telling bit of like a, a human socio cultural history. Uh, in the, uh, and it, it fits very well with this this concept, right? With the the uh, the Oankali are xenophiles. They crave that which is different, whereas the humans have a propensity to be xenophobes. 
that's the thing I like you know it's different. um i mean it's you don't have to be that much different to somebody just not to like you it's 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 quite disturbing how much mm. sometimes people are so quick to um hate someone to, mm-hmm. for a little difference like, i think so. it, it goes all it, it goes back to what um nikan said to i think it was joseph in the first book uh, and joseph and Lilith, when it's like you know differences difference dangerous right different is uh, different might kill you and, and that was true for your ancestors and it's just true for you yeah. uh and that uh there's a degree to which the, the, there is a certain legitimacy to being afraid of the different because it is you know it's an unknown unknown yes. right it, it's a thing that you yeah it, it, it's it, it it makes uh sense to be cautious to be concerned about something which is new because you don't know if it's going to be dangerous or not uh and yeah so it's a, it's a difficult thing to uh to avoid and it, it's interesting that the the Owen Carly have this uh the degree of xenophilia that they do because it it, it uh um, it kind of says something about their history right? and, and their power, right? Because it, it seems to indicate that they are powerful and resilient enough, or have been in their history, that when they encounter new things that, that might well be that dangerous some, yeah, to them, they're not worried that they will affect them. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's worked out for them in the, in the past, right? They're, they've they've been successful in their their xenophilia, which is uh, yeah, uh, it's an interesting kind of notion. Mm. And actually, it, it, to bring it back to to game theory. Um, mm-hmm. When you're playing an, an an iterated prisoner's dilemma, right, where, where you you have to um, play the prisoner's dilemma game, where you can uh, either um, uh, uh, cooperate, in which case you um, get one year, was it, and then I'll say something and you're free, but the other person. Well, gets there are some... slightly different formulations on the the reward structure, but it's basically you, if you cooperate, you get the best outcome. Mm-hmm. If one of you defects, you have the worst outcome, and the other person has a. a a better outcome than you um and then uh, uh both of you defecting you both get really bad outcomes yeah. um so you have this this difficulty of picking whether or not you should uh, uh cooperate to try and get the optimal outcome but you might get screwed because the other person defects um uh so the um but if you play this if you simulate playing it the best strategy for it is is tit for tat right um in in many different versions of the the uh, simulation so like if if someone defects on you then you defect back if somebody uh cooperates then then you cooperate back but um a slightly generous tit for tat right so it opens on the cooperate move rather than opening on the defect mm-hmm. move and maybe it might have some very small random chance of um uh agreeing to cooperate again instead of doing the the hard tit for tat that strategy tends to be like the best one mm-hmm. because it then it doesn't get stuck in a uh, uh a tit for tat loop with a with a slightly um less good strategy right because if it if it occasionally is willing to uh let something slide then it has the opportunity to get back into a positive uh subsequent mm-hmm. set of interactions so it's not infinitely iterating on the 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 defect loop right um but yeah, so the the I think the the Oankali strategy of, of opening on the uh, the cooperate move, uh, as it were, right, being xenophil- xenophilic, right, operating, uh, having a uh, a cooperate on the first move approach, uh, and has uh, has some some firm game theoretic basis to some. I mean, degree. it also makes sense well, the fact from that they probably absorbed by now thousands of different thousands upon thousands of different um mm-hmm. species i would say throughout the whole universe meaning that they've encountered enough different that it's not much of a issue for them to be oh if it's like mm. you know they can adjust well enough to any problems they can encounter relatively quickly mm-hmm. i think that's also um relevant to their sense of kind of identity because this is another thing that kind of comes up a lot as one of the themes in this book is is the whole like what does it mean to be human question uh, and exploring the borders of that mm-hmm. and Lilith and many of the other humans are, are quite uncomfortable with the idea of of you know, the kind of the uh, like the pollution as it were of, of the human race or like the dilution the mixing mm-hmm. of the uh, um, the the human species because it's you know, it ultimately means it's going to go away but that's not a um, 
that's not a component of the identity of the Oankami, right? They don't regard themselves as being diluted in their Oankaliness by mixing with others because it, that mixing is, what, is that, the center of their identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's what they do. Actually, that, that's an, an interesting analogy to, to belief as well. But it's um, also, but the problem with that is that there is a, mm-hmm. uh, it always, but the problem with that statement is, Richard, that they do have those three different groups of Onkali, right? Within those, like, let's say, tribes. Mm-hmm. One that creates yeah, the yeah. ship and uh, it stays on the planet. The other one stays with the original planet and mix. But there's always one group that doesn't mix. Mm-hmm. But I think that's that's um, a part of the the success of their their strategy in 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 the the xenophilia, right? It it's it's xenophilic enough that they can incorporate the new strong stuff, but it's just conservative enough in 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 not having that mixing in that branch that that's kind of the you know the backup branch in case something goes wrong with one of these mixes that they they still have you know a, a group that will uh, survive, right? It. I think actually that's um, a key component of the success of this strategy that they have is that they do that. It, it, it has this, 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 you know, to make like the political analogy, right? They have the conservative branch and they have like a super sort of open liberal progressive branch. And then there's one that's kind of down the middle, right? Uh, so, you know, they're, they're, they're willing to, to experiment on, on, on this end and then they're, they're willing to, to retain what has worked before on the other end. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it balances well for them, oh. but yeah, I just. But go on, go on. So I was just—I wanted to make an analogy between the um, uh, the the identity with the trading um, that the Oankali have mm-hmm. to um, beliefs, right? Because people in um, uh, discussions about what they believe are quite frequently identified with like specific uh, things that they believe. It becomes a kind of important part of your identity to believe a particular thing, um, or you know, you think of yourself as the kind of person who believes X, and you see this quite a lot in political discourse, and it's often a source of um, people feeling personally attacked or personally offended by something because it, it's it, they regard that belief as being a, an important component of their identity. But if instead of identifying with the specific things you believe, you identify with being the sort of person who who tries to believe true things, right? Or the sort of person who who will you know follow the evidence where it leads, who, who will be skeptical of whatever their beliefs are and, and believe for that which seems most plausible, then you're not subject to the same difficulty of identity when you're scrutinizing your own beliefs and discussing stuff that is politically contentious because you you're not identified with the specifics of what you would believe. You're identified with the, like the quality of the process by which you came to those beliefs. Yep. Um, and, and that's, um, I think, a thing that is kind of under-discussed in political discourse, because uh, and I know people just sort of don't don't uh, uh, think about it in those terms. But uh, and I think that's quite strongly analogous to this this notion that the Oankali have um, of that they're not identified with the specifics of their biology, right? They don't the the particular things, the particular properties that they have uh, physically are not. Like important to who they are, the thing that's important to who they are is the fact that they trade. No, I absolutely agree. But yeah. the thing is, hmm. yes, in in terms of Onkali, yes, I think that's that's what's taking place in here. That's um, that allows it for that sort of balance in a way. Um, hmm. The problem with the beliefs and you know with with humans is that a lot of those beliefs, yeah. As you know, as we try as scientists, we've been sort of trained to keep an eye on things that and look for the actual truth or the objective facts that are there, not just looking at someone's opinions. And but the problem is that in a lot of those cases is that things like media can influence, uh, hmm. affect your emotions, which then uh, make it much makes it much harder to to state it on the objective sort of investigation of the truth, right? Mm-hmm. But I say, even among the scientific community, it's not something oh, that we of course, um, of course. sort of. It's not something that we talk about explicitly. It's not a um, like the the. Um, it is something that kind of happens uh, slightly more frequently than than is is normal among scientists, right? Because they, they identify with with being 
scientific in their methods, right? They identify with uh, kind of you know following the scientific method to to get to their conclusion. Identify with with being skeptics about this kind of thing. So that happens a little bit more commonly, but it's rarely a thing that we kind of think about explicitly no, or, or in sort of meta sense, right? As as a as a kind of stance that it's it's valuable to adopt to not be overly identified with the 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 specific things that you believe, but rather with the um, like the the commitment to uh, uh, using reliable mm-hmm. methods to come by those beliefs. No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and and I think that's actually a uh, uh, a psychologically useful frame to have when when thinking about uh, what it is that you believe and, and why, because uh, it, it helps you to. Um, it actually, you know, like, if you think of your, your identity in those terms, it, it's actually it's rewarding when you change your mind about something. It's, it's it, because it's ah, I, I've followed the method, right? I've learned something new. I've got a, a model of in my mind that now more closely matches the world, right? It's a good thing. I th- Whereas change for someone who has an attachment to a, a, a specific position it can be much more uh, sort of emotionally challenging, much more more traumatic because it's it. It requires a change to your sense of identity to change your beliefs. I mean, I think there's a great example of this. If you, if for our, our listeners, I'm, sure, I think we already mentioned it a few times, but read Harry Potter and Methods of Rationality. There's the perfect example of <laughs> what Richard is talking about in there. And to be fair, I've been rereading that uh, that fan fiction again. It's it's brilliant, um, especially the science part, but. It the the topic that we're discussing there is brilliantly described of uh, between interaction of Harry and Draco Malfoy. So I would highly recommend people who haven't read it to read it. It's it's a great p- piece of mm. fanfic that, to be honest, I feel like should be canon, sort of uh, like in Marvel multi universe. <laughs> but you know where Harry is graced by scientific uh, science. Mm. Uh, you know, in, in a yeah. house full of love and in a very, very scientific approach. <laughs> yeah, I, I I love that book. I mean, apparently, some people get rubbed the wrong the wrong way by it. But um, I, to be honest, I uh, am a dead fan of <laughs> Harry Potter. And no matter what somebody tells me how bad the book is or J.K. Rowling, blah blah, I love it. It was my childhood thing, and I love it. And it doesn't matter. Oh yeah, yeah. As I, I I love the canon version. I love the new version. But like um, Harry, the character in the some people pursue, like. We're, um, you know, sort of skeptics and like, you know, sort of slightly precocious smart asses in our own right, yeah. right? So we identify with Harry. <laughs> Other people think he's a dick. <laughs> to be fair, he's a dick. Like, there's no other thing. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there are reasons for that in yes. the book, but it's like, yeah. Uh, to be f- anyway, anyway, we've, yes, uh, we've, we've got yes, sidetracked. Yes, a lot. Like, from, <laughs> yes, talking about on Kali to uh, Harry Potter. So, yes. But mm. anyway, um, I, I think... Please go read, guys. Honestly, it's it's fantastic, and um, it really talks about a lot of topics out there that we cover actually, and in a way that are really mm-hmm. easily to really easy to understand and very yes, funny. Yes, absolutely. So the chapter ends with uh, Akin eating near where the men were. He was afraid they would seriously hurt him, so he stayed close if he tried to run away. Obviously, so he's just trying to st- stay close. As he was sitting, uh, admiring several ants, each of the size of a man's forefinger um so it's like are we talking about like a piece yeah, of this is a large like are we talking about like a uh the little bone of a finger or are we talking about actual finger i think it sounds like an actual finger which, yeah like yeah, it's, I, mean, it's... I, that, but, I mean there are all ants that are like the the size of like i mean the first two joints on my finger i think i don't know of anything that's like long enough to be the full Finger. I mean, come on, like, what the hell did Don Kali do to make them so big? But any, so it's just like, I just imagine it's like, what? Um, hmm. And as he was admiring those ads that, that in the book described them, like, if it, they bit a human, they would be like, basically like bullet ants, you, your, your hand would be like in agonizing pain. One of the men grabbed hmm. him and went towards the river. Akin saw that the three men were carrying the boat and there was no sign of the fifth man, the bleeding man. As they were in the canoe, no one said anything. One of them was crying for a man who seemed to hate everyone. Akin realized that the man could explode any second, so he made no sound, hardly moved. He must not be the trigger for the for the mm. explosion. That's interesting that that's his takeaway, right? Um, that you know, that this, this man is kind of uh, crying because this other guy uh, is uh, you know, near to death. But uh, Akin's takeaway from that is like, these guys are super unpredictable. 
and they, anything could set them off. No, honestly, uh, but in uh, the way he is right, yeah. because the man who was bleeding, mm. I assume, is the same one who was treating Akin from the beginning, you know, taking care of Akin from the beginning, the one who was holding by a leg, and mm. he's just, so it must have been that man. Mm -hmm. And I think so. The fact that, you know, they all were, you know, that he died because of the bleeding, internal bleeding. Uh, for whatever the reason was, it could be also could be as you said some sort of gastric cancer. Hmm. It suggests that um, you know that those men were long enough on the planet, um, struggling together. That you know no matter hmm. what, like they both, all of them sort of cared for each other, right? So um, if Akin, I would also agree be quiet if I was like you know Akin. So I just be like quiet, hide, don't don't make bring attention to yourself because the men potentially could release their frustrations on him right so mm -hmm. yep yep they, uh, they seem to be uh, somewhat emotionally unstable yeah so i guess my chapter five prediction i mean i completely missed the mark on chapter five but um i thought that maybe the chapter five will finally make us reach the you know there'll be some journey going down the up the river blah 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 but they'll finally reach phoenix and then what we see there is like Although initially the book was talking about like the, the the town sort of losing the population because people realizing what they were doing was useless, because uh, no matter. Mm -hmm. But maybe because of the southerners, we would see there it's city full of people and full of guns that they th thinking that they can mm. take on Onkali on. So okay, okay, that was my prediction. We 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 didn't quite get no, there yet. No, 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 so, uh, I completely missed the mark no. on this one because we are back in with the Chan and uh, on Kal in the and the low village in chapter five. Yes, uh, yeah, okay, uh, change of uh, change of setting, returning to a different part of the of the story. Yeah. Um, do you want to uh, start yep. on something? So in this chapter, we learn a bit about the process of birth in the Onkali, which I think is fascinating. Um, the mm. Chan helped Arjas to a sitting position and placed himself behind her so she could rest against him. She never needed that before, but only this one time. In the act of giving birth, contact with all the family members was necessary. It was important because solitary births would produce an uloi. It was too soon for a construct uloi, right? The, such children would grow, uh, would have been mm. sent to the ship to grow up among low relatives up on the ship. Lilith was there with them as I just shared Lilith's births. Lilith would do the same for her. Yeah, I think that there's an interesting point here that they say um, it, it's too soon for a construct Uloi, um, which is, uh, I think that they had the same kind of uh, reticence about like uh, two human um, male offspring. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like they're even more reticent than having uh, excessively human male offspring. Um, than they are about having uh, the Uloi human hybrid offspring, which is uh, interesting to note, right? So the Uloi have other ones who have kind of the most capability, but uh, yeah, so I suppose it makes sense that they're more reticent even there. Uh, but also the um, this kind of um, the fact that the 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 if the Amakali are giving birth uh, in a solitary fashion without the family members like making contact with them, I think is a really interesting kind of uh, biological insight. Right, this little little uh, twist on the way their biology works. Um, like they're more likely to give birth to an uloi or, or um, a, a, some offspring that's probably going to become an uloi if they don't have this contact. And of course, the Uloi are a kind of key for their ability to reproduce, and they're, um, they're just more capable in hostile scenarios because of their like um, stingers. And, and also and, the and possibility so of like the modifying like quick response to any changes or uh, mm -hmm. damage to the body. So it it makes yeah, sense that yeah, like they are sort of the, the way to preserve in a way their species in in the hostile environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that uh, I think that. I'm struggling to come up with a specific biological example of this, but I, I, I think this is a, a phenomenon to some degree that you know you, you, there is a certain amount of adaptation to contextual cues uh, that you get um, from from uh, real biological systems, right? If, if you don't have the indicators in your environment that this is you know a, a stable one that you might expect an, an, an ordinary strategy to work in, versus one where you need to be ready for for a more stressful context. That's Isn't a, there? Aren't there any fish? I, I think there's a fish that can change their um, sex 
um, based on the environment, like uh, the population size and environment, I think. Hmm. I think so. Yeah, I, I, I can't really recall any kind of specific like like life histories of a particular species that that does this, but it's uh, yeah. I, I think there are there are certainly fish that, that change their their sex, but I, I I can't recall if there's any that do it like specifically in response to being in like a stressful environment in which they're born or whatever. But yeah, I'm I, it would not surprise me. Yeah, I think I've read about a certain species of fish that I think it's like if the population grows too much and mm-hmm. oh, if the I don't remember which way it went. It's either the population grows too much and the, so there's too many females, then some of them turn into males. Or if it is not enough, if the population is too scarce, some of some of the females turn to males. So uh, sorry, some males turn into females, so that they can. Uh, there's a higher chance of um, the population uh, reestablishment. So I don't remember exactly, but hmm. there is. I think I'm pretty certain that there's a uh, an animal out there, and I'm pretty sure it's a fish that does mm-hmm. it. Yeah, we'll have to look yeah, it up. We'll have to look in, <laughs> so look in the references, everyone. But yes, so the we have. Um... Dishan giving uh, Hadris rather giving birth. Yes, um, in the process of giving birth. So um, we know that Tina was on the ship in the status uh, healing in the ah, yes. tank, as you mm-hmm. as you wrote. <laughs> yeah, for some reason that made me think of the you know the Star Wars Bacta tanks. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, in a healing pod. And he, we were told that he would probably not remember what happened, or at least had a vague situ memories of what what took place so after tina was on the ship was taken to the ship they were planning to join looking for a king um but then actually the child decided to be born and we know so mm. I, we are told about a bit differences after the meeting with don kali of the birth cycle so for humans mm. it's 11 months uh original which was original nine and 15 for don kali instead of the 18 months Ah, okay, yeah. So the connection with humans changed things. Um, and this is an excerpt from a book. Humans were so quick about everything, quick and potentially deadly. Construct births on both sides had to be more careful, carefully conventional than human and oral Kali births. Missing parents had to be simulated by the Uloi. The role had to be introduced very slowly after the child had gotten to know its parents. Lilith could not simply assist mm. at the birth and leave. Nikanj had it all, uh, had all it it could to do yeah. Nikanj had all it could do simulating Joseph and being itself for the child. More would be uncertain, hmm. unsafe for the construct child. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So it's the 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 development seems to uh, or at least of the constructs it, it re- sort of requires the ongoing presence of the the parents, which is a, an interesting mm. notion. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. And also the um the eleven month um uh, gestation in humans or in humans carrying a construct child is uh, an extra three months, I, right? That's, no, uh, it's, I just imagine like, you know, yeah, like, can you imagine like a nine month uh, pregnant woman when you look at it, it's like you can tell the person mm. is struggling. Like the, the lady is just like, I mean, I remember my mother and I remember many, you know, females before that just like, it's just mm-hmm. such a weight and problem of, you know, all the organs being squished and peeing every five seconds because the bladder is being kicked and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So imagine three extra months of that. Yeah. Like, wow. Uh, that's the... Yeah. And it was already an imposition, like making Lilith pregnant uh, by Nakanj without having sort of, uh, you know, uh, really consulted her consciously about that. And now it's an extra three months <laughs> on top of that. But, when I, but, but the thing is, right... Uh-huh. There's a reason why we women give birth at nine months is because if we waited longer, it's mm. a problem of the baby may not be able to come out from the vaginal canal, right? Because the you know the hips, even though like the uh, pelvis is adjusting mm. to the you know for giving birth, but like still, I, th- I think I think we um I think this may have come up before with the whole sort of evolution of human intelligence thing and and, and our long childhoods because. Like humans are, are born um, quite prematurely. I think it's also because uh, of the standing to... posture. I think also. Yeah, yeah. This is the whole kind of the the trade off between having increasing cranial volume 
and um, the ability to run with hip width. So like if, if, if women's hips get much wider than they are within the current range uh, f- of, of women's hips, then they basically can't run effectively. Um, like, bipedally, it becomes a real problem to run once your hips get beyond a certain point, just you know, biophysically, right? So we can't get much wider in terms of the, the hip width uh, without having... Um, without having a problem mm-hmm. running. So there's like an upper limit on how wide the hips can be and how big the the, um, the the birth canal can be. So that meant there was a constraint on the maximum size of the head of the baby because it has to fit yes. through the gap, right? Um, and that also means that uh, as, as a consequence of that, we're, we're born quite um, young, uh, relatively speaking, right? So, I mean, if you look at, say... Um, I mean, look uh, at the animals. Actually, you, you would have literally yeah. fully functional, I mean, uh, basically a miniature versions of the adults. Exactly. Right. And, um, I mean, I, I once watched um, an alpaca being mm-hmm. born, um, and the the baby alpaca, you know, we, we pulled out of the, the mother alpaca and kind of you know, flopped on the floor for a second and then just like stood up and started walking around <laughs> immediately. Right. Uh, and human babies are. Uh, basically completely useless and utterly helpless for like an extended period of time after they're born uh, and they, you know they can't they don't even have the like the musculature to support their own heads Im- immediately after being born let alone like get up and walk away uh, um, and a, 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 a part of that is because of the the constraint of of, of uh, you know women's uh, um, hip sizes uh and and the you know ability to have a big brain so you know we do a lot more development um out of the womb than most other animals do um and you know, there's a whole kind of debate over to what degree this might have contributed to the, the development of our in- intelligence and the kind of um, you know, the long childhood that we have. I mean, in so a way, but, it's uh, also yeah. it's indicative of um, why humans are a um, like developed civilizations, right? Because it's something that uh, Margaret Mee, that the lady was mentioned actually in the book one, who was the uh, what's the paleontologist? No. Uh, um, an anthropologist. Anthropologist. Sorry, yes. She talked about like what's the first signs of civilization, and potentially is the fact that you no, know, when people get sick, when animals get sick, usually sick, they usually are left on their own, right? If they cannot catch up with their um, with their um, group, um, then they usually <clears throat> die. Whereas in humans, if the like. The fact that the first sign of civilization is that a fusing bone, right? That somebody had to be there, or somebody broke their bone, and had somebody had to be there to provide them with food, shelter, water, blah blah, blah so that they you know mm-hmm. they can survive, right? And I think it's also the same with the giving birth, right? There has to be someone to assist the woman giving birth, to take care of her, because she'll be exhausted after that, especially in the circumstances where there's like literally nothing, right? So you have to bring food, mm-hmm. shelter, or protect against any predators and stuff like that, right? So yeah. all of that. So I think like th- this is kind of among the hypotheses for for that kind of um, like origin of of uh, cooperation civilization stuff in that like the the sort of the pattern that we developed for caring for for children. Mm-hmm because of that evolutionary constraint kind of mapped onto the pattern for caring mm-hmm. for others at a later point. But yeah, I mean, it's all very hypothetical because that's a difficult set of stuff to to sort of demonstrate more empirically, right? Because we, we only have what we can infer from, from the history of it. We can't I mean, really we can't just them. have some people but, throw uh, them into a jungle and see what's going to happen. But, you know, it's... <laughs> yeah, you know, the ethics committees have a problem with this. <laughs> <laughs> I might some, it's my find an issue or two or something. I, I'm, I'm certain, you know. <laughs> so I'm sure they find something. But yeah, yeah in all seriousness, like, I think that sort of explains this this, this, this situation, right? Like, the, the whole idea. And so I cannot imagine, like, the Maybe. three... Like, three extra months. My, my goodness. Unless the gestation is a bit slower. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that was my thinking, right? Because it, it, it can't like three extra months of growth is not something that a human can physically accommodate um so it must be going a bit slower i think slower. it might be <laughs> Otherwise... physically might be slower but i think it's the mental um gestation that is taking hmm. it's 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 like with the akin wasn't right when akin was in the like it, mm-hmm. the development of consciousness and the development of like the himself right the, the, the awareness hmm. of uh, one's self you know that might be the reason why it's the extra few months because just to help give yeah. times for the consciousness to develop so they are aware of you know um the environment and so i think actually it kind of makes sense with the um like the, you know, the genetic memory concept that they have so they have this kind of stronger um or slightly more biologically determined 
um, aspect to their um, to their early development, right? They have this um, because they have more control over their biology. They have this kind of feedback loop because you know, like their their culture influences their biology, but it means more of their biology can be uh, relevant to the development of their their culture. Uh, so you have this situation where you might want longer biological development mm-hmm. to to add or to to permit the the sort of um, the bio, the genetic memory and the biologically pre-programmed components of stuff to 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 develop and and uh, then you go on to having the the cultural stuff in the long childhood that that we the long developmental history that we have from from environmental influences so because there's more biological influence uh you have more time spent on that biological component then move on to the mm-hmm. cultural stuff but yeah it, it, i think it, it actually fits quite well with that yep. notion another kind of uh really well uh um well intuited um way this might work biologically uh for, from from octavia that just occurred to me now so no no, no you're absolutely right <laughs> anyway, absolutely right and yeah. just thinking about it mm-hmm. it actually makes sense right considering the fact that how um, most of the things that like this, I mean, Akin still is young, so he might not have the full, hasn't tapped in fully to that genetic memory, but there is still there that mm. you know we can tell that he's aware that he's uh, capable of understanding, or it, it's something that's out there, you know, like the boundary he's sensing that he was sensing when he was probing Lilith, like there might be something mm. there that you know answers those, uh, is an ex. A, an explanation to those things. Um, mm-hmm. But let's go back to the chapter because we've been going on the off tangent a lot. And, I mean, it makes sense because it's, it's giving some new information. Mm. So Nikanj was there with them, searching from where the child could appear. Would appear in humans, the child would always leave the same way. Uh, you know, the same orifice. It was a painful process, but Nikanj would call would always cut the pain away. For the Onkali, on the other hand, it was never painful, but they never knew which way would the child leave, and as there was no birth orifice, as as in humans. And I thought this was really interesting because it basically was like the mm-hmm. alien popping out of the you know stomach from the alien movie. It's just like it can come yeah. out from any place, right? And uh, meaning that one, as you mentioned in the in your comment, like the organ system, right? So like. What happens to the internal organs? Like, how how does the baby choose which way does it go? Like, is is um is female Onkali capable of like moving their organs around, or what what's going on? Yeah, it's a really interesting one, right? Because it it seems it it, it it seems weird that you wouldn't have a an uh, you know an an, or, an an orifice specifically for this function, or at least. You know, uh, one with a joint function like um like cloacas in, in yeah. birds but it's it's um it seems dangerous to, to not have a, a like a defined route out well, i feel like <laughs> as it talks about later on in the chapters like that you can't just touching it and then like the the the, um, the tissue around it starts bulging and molting moving right around and i think it's like mm. i imagine it like being like a sack inside like the amniotic side in humans mm. but then the baby's like, oh, okay, so probably this way is probably the best way to go. And the cells start to create like a canal in there, right? And then there's just yeah, sort of like uh, a small yeah. canal and it starts expanding more and more with the help of the oil. And from the description later on about the, the, the head tentacles of, of the baby, it sounds like you know they were kind of secreting something that was causing this this rippling yes, on, yes, on, yes, in, yes. in, in, in the, the tissues that we see. And that I think that kind of fits mm-hmm. with this idea of you know the, 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 it like responds to that and makes a channel. Um, but yeah, super super weird, unusual and way of doing that. I was that. trying yeah. to find a possible equivalent in nature of such mm-hmm. behavior. In a way, I mean, like you know, it's yeah, it's hard to find something like this. Like I mean, there are like for for example, um, um. there were like like for fertilization, right? It's easy to find examples of like fusing mm. and stuff like that. No, it's uh, you know, there's angler fish, for example, they fuse. But like for birthing, like something mm. like this, the only example. I-, I mean, there are is it bed bugs? Are you th- actually what were you? Going I was for? going What's for the-, the Suriname toad. That the one has okay. like oh, yeah, has. Yeah. Hmm. It's it, the eggs are laid at the back and then basically holes form when the where the tadpoles are supposed to come out and basically the fish oh, yeah. uh, sorry the the frog just goes into water and then just squeezes them out into the water right so something along those lines um, I mean some ideas were like um, 
seahorses, but seahorses are pretty much there's only one orifice mm. in males, right? But the Suriname mm-hmm. toad was like the closest idea I could think of. Mm. So I mentioned big bugs, and that's but I, I don't know about how they actually like lay the eggs as a result. But the female bed bugs don't have a um, they don't have like a genitalia. Mm. Um, the male bed bugs just like punch a hole in their carapace with like a barbed um, penis thing um, and in, in, inject the the sperm. But they don't like there's not a, a defined place for it. They just like punch a hole in the carapace mm. and. But that's the same thing. thing happens um, in the octopi, like the the two male octopuses will uh, octopi will uh, fight with each mm-hmm. other, like rip each other pen- penises and try to stab each other, and then whoever gets stabbed becomes the female. Ah, okay. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. That. yeah. Just imagine like, humans, like you know, ripping <laughs> dicks and just like trying to stab you, and if you get stabbed, you become the female. It's like. <laughs> And that's pretty weird, yeah. <laughs> My imagination is running wild at this point. <laughs> yeah. It's like you lose a fight and all of a <laughs> sudden <laughs> you're pregnant. It's like, I was, well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a weird one. Hmm. Yeah. Nature yeah, is strange. The, sometimes the evolutionary mechanism, you know, uh, animals, you know, reproduce or just be is just so weird. Yeah. The diversity of the different strategies and, and the... Uh, Brutality of some of them. It's a good way to describe it. Brutality. Mm. But anyway, yeah. So the, I I mean, part of my curiosity about this was kind of what's the origin of it. Um, you know, like what's the um, you know, what in the the history or the evolutionary history of the Owen Carly meant that this they didn't have a particular uh, Mm -hmm, orifice mm -hmm. for this. But uh, yeah. uh, I, I didn't really have any coherence. I, honestly, when you think it, about it, it but, makes sort of yeah. no sense because, like, I mean, if you have energy, to, like, energy-wise, spent energy to create a hole, like, now imagine now, like, there's no alloy around you, right? Something happened and you have to give hmm. birth, right? That means the baby obviously will become an alloy because of the hostile environment. But hmm. like, do you have the capability to create that hole by yourself, right? What if the baby just decides to make a hole through your forehead or something? I mean, that's a very. Yeah, uh, I mean, presumably, there's some chemotactic no, no, stuff course, going on like, to like direct very, it in a direction that's it's not. It's a very be... uh, over the top example, but you no, know, like there could be places that if yeah. it, if the baby decides to leave in that way, it could be dangerous for the body, right? Yeah, yeah. I just feel like that this evolutionary wise, it makes more sense to have a hole. Mm-hmm. Although I suppose it, it it is one of those things where it might be a. Um, uh, a use it or lose it type feature, right? Where the, there has not been a need for one to exist for a, a long time, so it's just become like a vestigial thing um, because the you know everyone is is now doing it this way, and so there's no selective pressure to maintain the previous mechanism. So it just atrophies. Uh, to be fair, I think uh, if we in, were able yeah. to see what the original, like the very primary, like the primary. Uh, um, hmm. Onkali. Yeah, it'd be super interesting to know more about the yeah. The ancestors. So the first ancestors yeah. of the like the first very first Onkali on their Onkali planet looked like. Then hmm. that would probably answer all the questions. To be fair. Yeah, yeah, probably it was a good, uh, good insight. But yeah, we're kind of uh, speculating yes, in the dark. Honestly, on that one. yeah, it's hard to tell because we can't unless the Onkali specify that, but probably not the one. This is just you know. But anyway. As this whole situation was okay. taking place, you no, know, like they were all in the meantime, they were all worried about Akin because the men who came through did not belong to any resistor village. They were nomads. Traveling traders when they had goods, raiders when they had nothing. Maybe they would try to raise Akin against the Onkali. Humans tried before this tactic, but never were a child so young. The Chan was worried about Akin. But that doesn't make sense because Akin is already so intelligent. They would have to literally get the child before even the, like, no, because Akin was already almost one year old. That's still too late for them. Hmm. Like, they would have to grab the child the moment it was born to actually for it to succeed. Mm -hmm. Um, The child uh, decided to emerge from Akshay's left side. She lay down on her right side and Dichan and uh, Lilith kept their contact while Nikan slowly massaged the area of the rippling flesh. This is an excerpt from the book. In tiny circular waves, the flesh withdrew itself from a central point, which grew slowly to show a darker grey, a temporary orifice which we, with, within which the child's head tentacles could be seen uh, moving slowly. These tentacles had released the substance that began the birth process. They were responsible now for the way uh, just flesh rippled aside. 
The kanji exposed one of its sensory hands, reached into the orifice and lightly touched the child's head tentacles. The head tentacles grabbed the sensory arm. I just knew the baby was coming out, so she lied down on her side. Without the touch, the child would prepare as if more uh, for a more dangerous environment and turn into an oloi. The child came out from the birth orifice. It was grey, full of head tentacles, but only with few small body tentacles. It had a human face. It also had an orifice at its throat, surrounded by pale, well-developed tentacles that moved slightly as the child breathed. That meant that the nose was only cosmetic. The child had full set of teeth, like all construct, and would be given everything to eat. The child imagined that Akin would keep himself alive by grazing and eating whatever he could find. Humans, though were always frightened when they saw a young child putting something strange in its mouth. If the raiders were conscientious, normal humans, they would might they might kill him. That's where the chapter ends. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, the description of the child is a little um weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you got the the Iwan Kali had tentacles but with like a human face and then this weird like throat orifice thing. It um uh reminds me most of one of those um uh, like stoma things that smoking yes you know, people who've smoked so much they have a, yeah a cat, yeah it's like a little extra throat orifice with like tentacles yeah that's exactly like what this. i imagined i was just like oh <laughs> oh uh, yeah i just that's, the thing um, is the fact yeah. that the child had teeth meaning that obviously it would eat hmm. normally using the mouth but the breathing was done through the orifice so technically there could it evolutionary wise they could probably they probably modify so there's a separation between the esophagus and uh, thorax so meaning that mm -hmm. like there's no problem yeah. with the baby eating food stuffing the food as much because it can breathe anyway which i think is a great advantage the amount of kids that mm. yeah that the is amount actually, of people yeah. and really choke themselves on food and the amount of kids that choke on food is just like ridiculous so yeah actually that's another problem with be humans being bipedal is that um like the alignment of our throat sort of skull and spine is is like really off for for the ability to swallow and not end up like accidentally yeah. getting stuff in yeah. our windpipe we're, we're much more prone to choking than something that's arranged horizontally with the spine um because like the the direction of the windpipe is is no longer like it's not got like a right angle hook at the top of the mm -hmm. the system right it's kind of in yeah. a straight line <laughs> uh yeah uh, yeah, choking hazard is one of the other things that uh, uh, kind of got a bit weird because of our bipedalism. I mean, to be fair, I yeah. think that the fact that us humans getting uh, bigger brains was much more beneficial than all the other things that other animals had is a significant example of nature being really weird. Mm -hmm. Like, you would think that, oh, you know, like... If you design humans to point O, you'd be like, oh, okay, let's get rid of like appendix, let's get rid of, you know, like fix that problems that are like the minor problems that have, have were created because of us even just standing upwards. Like that's the biggest problem. Like us mm. standing upwards was a big problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all of the, the back issues and yeah, so on. So yeah, so like you would think that, you know, humans 2.0, like, oh, okay, let's do that. But no, big brain time. So. Yep, uh, it, it 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 kind of like all of the other biological costs that we end up paying for having a bigger brain really illustrate how effective yeah. it is because we're having to you know absorb all these other problems as it's, a result of it. Uh, it literally and, is a no. big brain time for developing a big brain. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. those yeah. three chapters. Like one, we know, like we were told about, um, you know, the the whole fact on uh, what was continuing to happen to Akin, and then. Two, we were told about a bit more about the Onkali, which is nice because we get to learn about them a bit more. Mm. Yeah, it's always nice when we get a little bit more insight into the the biology of the Onkali because it's always it's always fascinating. It, Absolutely, and, uh, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and the whole um, and uh, it will be interesting here to know a little bit more about what what Lilith is thinking in this whole scene, right? Because uh, well, I suppose we she will have experienced it before by now, but the whole um, like the involvement. In, in the birth process for, for uh, one of the, the hybrid kids that's being carried by uh, the female Owen Kali, uh, uh, just, uh, that's a whole a whole other different weird biological thing that Leth has been roped into. I think it's I think we've talked uh, about this before but I think it's, you've said it before, that I think it has to be in a way that to establish the family right, it's, it's, it's confirmation like mm -hmm. the, the fact that everybody's involved is the reason why you know it's it's to ensure that the family structure is maintained right 
uh, yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, to to uh, be a, a, an aspect of, of um, sort of interpersonal bonding yeah. with respect to the the family unit, so yeah, they yeah. can uh, you know, successfully raise the kids with all of the resource demands mm-hmm. that that entails. But yeah. So some good, good chapters. chapters. And my chapter six prediction before I forget is exactly the same as chapter five. Ah, yes. Um, so mm-hmm. it's back to Akin and the men traveling towards Phoenix and maybe they meet finally reach the destination and there's some weird like I don't know uh arms race to trying to find Kali or maybe it's just a desolate vill- desolate you no know, village because there's no one le- left. I don't know. But it's I, I feel like they're gonna meet some other humans. Okay, so we're gonna see Phoenix. Yeah. The, uh, uh, if the, not the Phoenix, definitely there. some hum- other humans. Some other group of humans. Okay, then. <laughs> no, good uh, edging. <laughs> <laughs> Just leaving as many doors open so that you know I will always come out on top. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is how psychics Basically, work. Basically, yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay then. Okay then. Right. So uh, we should probably uh, wrap up. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. We are Xenothesis. Uh, you can find all the places we upload our podcast on xenothesis.com. I was Michael Glinka. I was Richard Acton. Bye bye.